I think there are redeeming qualities to each of the movies that we picked. He's turning. He's turning. He's a werewolf. It's time, it's time for the shit film break. Yeah. You suck on this silver bullet, Monty. I need to test if you're being real right now, mate. Welcome back to Foreplay. We are in the midst of our aptly named Spit Roast arc, where each of us has chosen a film that we enjoy, perhaps as a guilty pleasure, but we are confident that the other people will not enjoy. Uh, we started with my pick of The 13th Warrior, then we moved on to Thorin pick, Thorin's pick of Guy Ritchie's Revolver, and now here we are on Richard's pick, which is a film from 1974, a werewolf murder mystery called the beast must die and next week mm. as our fourth we of course take our nemesis roger ebert and we have selected 500 days of summer which he inexplicably gave a four-star review to and we will all torture ourselves and then mercilessly mock his taste for an entire yeah. hour or two I, I do have to say the one good thing about having 500 days of summer in the chamber is it did sort of embolden me to bring this to the table because <laughs> right. I know it can't be the worst movie. <laughs> like I know. And I also know that like, my opinions about it can't be as bad as giving a fucking max rating review to 500 days of summer. By the way, that is the part. Yeah. That is also where we have done Roger Dirty, but he did himself dirty. It's like, we're not saying that. These movies are 10 out of 10s, but he essentially did say 500 days of summer is exactly. a 10 out of 10. That's exactly. the craziest Part. We were you always know? safe yeah. in our in our choice. Yeah, because we I don't think like any, any of us were ever going to argue that oh. the films we picked were like great films, oh. like all time great films. Never. We it was more that we enjoy these films selfishly yeah. and we understand their flaws. Yes, completely. And and like <laughs> one of the things that I like that we've done you know, over the run of foreplay just in general, you know, because we're coming up on like, I don't know, 40 episodes or whatever it's been now, um, uh, is that we have picked a lot of flawed gems, I, I think. And, yeah. I, and, I, and I, think, I think that's important because one of the things that's super interesting about movies in general is this process that you go through. It's a collaboration with actors, directors, studio has to market it. It's art, but it's also commercial. There's all these like incongruous elements that go into making a film. And so from screenplay to screen, there's lots that can go wrong, lots that can go right accidentally. And I always think, yeah, those 10 out of 10 movies where everything's gone perfect and sometimes it's even been serendipitous that these amazing things have happened to make these you know movies as good as they are that's great but everyone talks about those films what people don't talk about are the ones that got close to greatness and kind of you know fell by the wayside or whatever and we've done a lot of that so big pat on the back now that said the beast must die never got close to greatness uh, i'm i'm acknowledging <laughs> that but he's he's already backpedaling guys after making us no, watch no, no, it. No, no, by no. the way richard richard so i want to say i hmm. rented this movie on amazon yeah. prime which where I'll, it was I'll available money. I'll, give me your paypal afterwards well. <laughs> that's okay. a dangerous game to play with our audience because they'll expect it as well <laughs> but what i want to say is do you think anyone noticed a very strange spike in the number of viewers of the beast must die because this must have been the biggest spike in like 20 years of people watching this movie in terms of purchasing it it must have it's a blip on somebody's radar somewhere do they do you think they know what caused it yeah, well, look, I mean, I, I, I'll definitely add this. Uh, uh, you can't get it in the UK right now anywhere. Um, fortunately <laughs> for me, I do have the Blu-ray of The Beast <laughs> Must Die. Uh, right? There's going to be some props coming out over the course of this. Um, but anyway, I, and, uh, I, it, as soon as it was released on Blu-ray, I, I, I had to rush out and get it because it is this like movie I've always had this kind of fixation on because of all of the elements that go into it. But yeah, what, what, what's interesting is Milton Sabotsky, the producer, who is the great legendary Amicus producer, he was able to sell the rights to this i always wanted to buy the rights to this film i was hoping one day i was going to be like wealthy and i could buy the rights and i could do anything with the beast must die ip because i think it's fantastic um and then they made a tv show out of it they made a t tv show with jared harris um and and so How, how's the, the tv beast show <laughs> Well, you know. I guess I love Jared Harris. So she makes me yeah. want to watch it, Loki. Yeah, no, you should you should check it out. I mean, put it this way: if you've made it through the movie, the t uh, like for me, I'm going to say the TV show is worse than the movie, right? 
Yeah. Of course, yeah. But obviously, it's modern, and I'll I'll just get this out the way. I acknowledge this movie would be better if the werewolf wasn't a dog. I, <laughs> I acknowledge that. <laughs> I do acknowledge that, Monty. Like, uh, you know, I want to make that abundantly clear from the start. What, the fact I, that I'm the, the big werewolf reveal is an Alsatian with Look. a weave. It's not great, you know. But, like, but let me, I, but let me I, ask I, you I a question. It's charming. I think it's charming. With this budget in 1974, mm. what would you have preferred that they do? Because I feel like it was actually maybe the best choice they could have made because otherwise it was like a man in a werewolf suit, which probably would have been worse. Bingo, that's what I'd go with. The problem you have is when a dog is not... If you've ever seen a wolf compared to a dog <laughs> side by side, a well, wolf not, is massive. Yeah. A wolf they also is move different. Huge. They run, they run yeah. differently. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so when a guy has to fight a werewolf, but the werewolf is a dog, even a big dog compared to a man, it's not intimidating. And there is, a, there is even a dog on werewolf fight. Yeah, where the, and they're the, the dog same size. Is, is the same size, right? It's true, it's true. So, so there's a lot of problems with that. <laughs> I would have definitely gone with the suit. I would have gone with the suit. It's tried, it's tested, it would have looked silly. Um, but for whatever reason in this, um, they, they brought in a dog and thought they could style it out. I mean, the premise of the movie meant it should have been okay. Um, but a lot happened to this movie in production. Obviously, the premise, just to get this out of the way, this is the one in this arc, we can describe the movie because Revolver is like 5,000 plot elements. This is very simple. <laughs> they, 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 they made the uh, Agatha Christie novel and then there were none. Yep. And the, 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 the premise of it just is a guy gathers a bunch of his colleagues no, here no, because it's, he's... It's, 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 uh, and then they were none. But what if we yeah. mashed it up with the really crappy short story, The Most Dangerous Game, and we... <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little bit a of that. A little bit of that too. Um, and so... It, 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 so he invites all of his colleagues into his like the luxurious mansion. The main guy, played by the fucking incredible Calvin Lockhart, is um, uh, super wealthy, and he just has a desire to take down the biggest game. And you go, oh, so he's going to kill all his guests, right? No, one of them's a werewolf, and that's the extra, that's the extra spice in the gumbo. Because one of you sitting here in this room is a werewolf. <laughs> Um, and so he he knows because of the things that have happened in their lives. And this is also like inadvertently comedic. Like he goes to like, and you, a concert pianist, played by Michael Gambon. Um, he goes, uh, everywhere you play, a woman gets her throat ripped out. Well, I, I should do hope he's the fucking werewolf, because if he isn't, <laughs> what, we're just going to ignore the murder? He goes to that chick, Davina. He goes, and every time you have a party, guests turn up half eaten. And you go, what? <laughs> they do? Well, I hope, I hope they're all werewolves then. But no, he's not interested in that. He's only interested in the werewolf. So if you're he, a friend he, of his, he, he, just doesn't, he doesn't care about the cannibals. Merely the werewolf. No. <laughs> uh, the, what, Which, by the way, it, I, I will say mm. the cast of this film is quite impressive. It's, it's actually yeah. insane, isn't it? When you watch yeah, it, you're like, <laughs> is, that really, is that really him? Yeah, like, it, Michael Gambon, Peter Cushing, Peter Cushing, Charles yeah. Gray, yeah. like Michael yeah. Gambon. Yeah. Like, holy shit. Yeah. Like, the casting was actually very good. <laughs> for this by film, way, no, I was going to say one thing at the outset. Oh, by the way, the other thing which you didn't say is what happens is when you piece by piece try to figure out who it is, mm. then what they, as Richard pointed out on a previous episode, the problem is it turns out actually this is a production thing. It wasn't even in the script. Like they just do no. a thing where they just go, like, now if you've got 30 seconds to guess <laughs> who it is, break. and they do an actual clock. Like the that. clock yeah. I, this is the werewolf break. Have you guessed who the werewolf is? You have 30 seconds to give your answer. Which it turns Brilliant. out is just some stupid focus group thing or something, right? Which is, the, that was totally well, unnecessary. Yeah. You didn't need that at <laughs> do, all. Do, do you want to know what's really funny? Uh, the director, right, um, Paul, Paul Annette, who had never directed a film uh, he never directed a feature film before and never directed another one. He was from TV. He did like EastEnders, Grange oh, Hill. Hell. 
Yeah, he did like standard television stuff. Um, okay. He did like Paul Dark and some of. But he did some well. episodes of Baker Grove. Fucking hell, man! Like this is yeah. actually pretty decent for him, then. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's yeah, yeah, yeah. Baker okay, Grove. Fair play. Yeah. Fair play. So anyway, Paul and that right. He went to see the movie <laughs> after it had been done, and then he just saw at the start. You oh will get God. your, and he was. Go- <laughs> And they added it on. They tacked it on and didn't tell him. They sure. just put that part in post production because Milton Sabotsky was like, "This is just a really crappy werewolf movie unless we add like a little bit and a little extra element." And so Milton Sabotsky in just post production added this idea that it was a detective film, and also as well, I mean, I'll add it's got the world's shittest car chase. <laughs> I'm also, I'm coming, I come in peace, guys. That car chase, that was also Milton Sabotsky's idea. You know, what Paul Annette thought he was directing, he thought it was going to be like character actors in a room. And you're the werewolf, aren't you? And no, I don't think so, sir. Uh, look, I'm that holding been a silver candle. <laughs> right, and that, that was the movie Paul Annette wanted to make. And that is the movie I remember in my brain. Um, <laughs> and will always be fond of, because I think when it has those scenes and it's Calvin Lockhart going around accusing everyone, that's when the movie really shines. What about our little lady friend who's so anxious to get out of here? Maybe she has reasons we don't know about. Care to show us, Davina? Leave her alone, Newcliffe. Careful, Jan. Yeah, uh, yeah, and that, and 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 then it's these other parts that detract from its great inherent greatness. <laughs> By the way, um, <laughs> you know. what I would just say at the outset is this: I, I'm sort of like halfway to Richard's position. I don't think it's oh, actually God. a good film. Like, and spoiler: the key thing about this film is, if there was ever a film that can only be watched once, it is this movie. Like, by definition, <laughs> it's just not good enough to hold up because essentially it's already the premise of who, who when they're going to reveal who it is. That's Richard's sort of like, I've going. seen this movie 32 times. <laughs> So yes, the key thing for easily, me is this. Easily. The, re- the reason why I immediately understood why Richard liked it is because it's not actually about, like, even though there's a couple of good performances, it's not really about, like, filmmaking and you're not really, like, tensely in the scene. But I actually think the premise is a great premise. The way they do it is very good. Like, put it this way. Mm. If this had been a 50-minute Twilight Zone episode, could have been pretty good. Because if you know Twilight Zone episodes, some of them don't actually get totally stick the land in or they you know they're just like a good premise that's sort of like ah halfway through you're like well whatever that's okay i like the first part you know like i actually think the initial premise isn't bad especially because Mm. obviously people are going to watch this and if they do know peter cushing i mean the sad thing is everyone's only going to know for fucking star wars not he was obviously the wolf man like that's the that's the reason why it's genius to cast him he's the ultimate red herring isn't he because in your brain you automatically assume he could be and he knows a lot about fucking werewolves so but okay for that one side then you got michael gambon you've seen him in all the movies He's having your dickheads. You don't now know his name, but that's Dumbledore. okay. He's Umas. Yeah, it's all right. You just know him in all the movies. You, think, you know, and when you go through that, but obviously, like Richard says, the sleeper is the actual protagonist. The Calvin Lockhart guy and yes. this character he plays with this, like, weird accent he puts on. It's actually fire. Like, he's actually low-key on some, like, shaft level of cool in this movie. Like, yeah, he's just yeah. a ball of that guy, isn't he? Yeah. He took his rifle. Track it. Corner it and kill it as I shall. Yeah, no, this is the thing. So Calvin Lockhart's a super interesting figure to me because, uh, as I said on previous episodes, the two things I really care about in life, it's not it's not friends, not family. It is horror movies and black exploitation movies. That's it. That's all I need <laughs> on my little island of solitude. And Calvin Lockhart. So is a explain super explain black exploitation first to people who don't know what oh, this so is. So black 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 exploitation essentially in America when uh, the black community were becoming increasingly empowered to make media that represented them. You have a run of these movies which are colloquially known as black exploitation, but essentially are black produced, black acted, black targeted movies that are that you know loads of great stuff comes out of that people will remember dolomite obviously because the shaft. recent the eddie the eddie murphy movie shaft is another good example that's actually an example of kind of a mainstream black exploitation movie where kind of like hollywood were like oh okay we, we got something cooking over here coffee is the other one which you know helped launch i mean pam Grier was already fantastic and well known by that point but that's the movie everyone kind of points to and says that's her breakout um although i disagree with that 
Kelvin Lockhart was one of these people who was just a fantastic character actor in a lot of these black exploitation movies. And one of the one of the one of the great tragedies, I would argue, um, is that his career trajectory never quite took off. Because I think he's fantastic, and and there's a reason he's fantastic. He was a classically trained actor. You will not find many people who starred in black exploitation movies oh. that were also in. He he was in the Royal Shakespeare Company in in Britain. He he was he he was, he's incredible and he's incredible in this film. He's the whole movie for me. I mean, everyone, yeah. all the little character actors, they all get a scene and they're all yeah. really good. There's there's some actually really snappy poppy dialogue in this movie. But um, Calvin Lockhart is fucking fantastic. He is immense and um, for me, I, like Calvin Lockhart, uh, I would I would probably say if you wanted to see him in something um, that uh, that really shows just how good he could be uh i would, I would if you're into black exploitation movies i would say go watch cotton comes to harlem he is fucking fantastic in that film i showed you guys a clip of it but people will already know who calvin lockhart is and they will not know who calvin lockhart is because if you've seen predator 2 the fucking the the, the yardy rastafarian drug lord king willie is played by Calvin Lockhart in in, in, in the later part of his Probably career. The best part the, of that film. Yeah, exactly right. The guy who the guy who's saying like, "There's no killing what can't be killed." Yeah. Yeah, that's fucking <laughs> Calvin Lockhart, man. Oh, yeah. Um, and 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 this is this is this is why I love this guy. And, and you, it, it's really interesting that you picked upon the shaft thing. They were quite literally going for coding. The haircut looks the same, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They 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 uh, instructed right. him to kind of grow his hair out a little bit. I thought he when, killed by it. By the way. There's a scene where he literally says, the, the full moon's coming out. I'm going to get some rest. And he changes into a skin-tight black leather, leather jacket. Shirt. <laughs> it's right? so funny. A leather ja with no it's not a jacket. Beneath. It's not a jacket. It's just a shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what even Dude, is that? I laughed I so I know, hard when he did that. And he's like, "This is." I, I, I was sitting there with my wife, and I was just, I just said, "This is my sleeping shirt." As he was putting it on, and he, and he just <laughs> grabs, like a, he grabs leather. like a bolt action yeah. hunting rifle, and he just yep. sits in a leather chair, and he just turns off Brilliant. the lights, and then just leans yep. back and like rests in front of the Polish security guy in his house. Yeah. By the I, way, I, here's I, the thing. Obviously, weird. we're gonna do all the good parts, so I we'll have to do some roasting. So I'll, here's one of my yeah. roasts. One of my well, roasts is. Even though actually, like, for example, on some of the scenes, I did think there was a little bit of tension sometimes or of obviously one thing they did a decent job with. We'll get to this. I have some criticisms later. But like initially they do a half decent job of giving like Richard says, everyone like a classic Agatha Christie novel. Everyone has to have a way they could have been it and you can't mm -hmm. totally eliminate them. And also then whoever they don't implicate, you have to think, well, maybe they're secretly. And it does that thing pretty well. Not bad at the beginning. Doesn't necessarily execute it. But when it got to the scene where think about the whole premise of the movie was slowly building every element up when it just scores and he's just playing Moonlight Sonata. I did laugh out loud. Like that is such a fucking hack thing to put in the film. It's that, that, that I did just laugh like oh now now you just fucking you know that's really? that's called over egging right. the pudding in England, you uh, know what I mean? All right. I look <laughs> These guys are making this movie sound like a lot cooler than it is because the premise is cool and there are certain scenes that are okay. But what they're not telling you, if you didn't watch this, and please do not watch this movie, is that... Definitely it, watch this movie. Do, do not watch this movie. It, it is watch this horribly movie. boring for most of it. And there is not, there's literally nothing that happens. Thorne, to your point, I was going to say this. Like, if this was a, not Twilight Zone, but if this was less than an hour long, it might actually be tolerable. The problem is, is that you guys oh, said that, that the 13th warrior was fucking nothing happening and only 90 minutes long. There's nothing that happens in this movie. There's nothing that happens. I clocked it. I started this film and right off the bat, the first thing that happens is they say, there will be a werewolf break. After all the clues have been shown, you will get a chance to give your answer. Watch for the werewolf break. And you yes. will have to guess yes. who the... So we go through that, which is just... Uh, he didn't absolutely... guess who the werewolf was, though. <laughs> How could you? Let's there are no clues. <laughs> exactly. Well, yeah, so we're getting get there. We're getting there, Richard. We're getting there. But then what happens, guys, is there is the first 
10 minutes of this movie, 10 minutes, it's 10, it's actually nine minutes. It's nine minutes of yep. this movie is an explanation of the werewolf break, which is coming, which is just such an absurd way to start this movie, followed by an extremely poorly shot sequence of Calvin Lockhart, a man who you don't know, running through the moors and into the forest and being hunted by a bunch of guys with rifles, which obviously you're like, why are they hunting this black guy? And it's, you know, rolls you in. If, if you're American, you're thinking, you know, certain historical things because you don't have a time and place for this yet. Um, yes. And so it doesn't draw you in, Richard. It literally is a pointless chase that is entirely fake drama because at the end, they fake shoot him and he's like, haha, just it was testing a my drawn. security it was a system. Drawn. Exactly. Yes. I said, what yes. the fuck? I literally, it wasted 10 minutes of my life, Richard, and I want those 10 minutes back. <laughs> Mate, that, that, that is called the bait and switch money. No, it it's is terrible. A, <laughs> it is a classic premise. That used in films today. Some some say that the beast must die pioneered that. Oh some say my that. god! Not, so, so, not some me, say... <laughs> but some do. I say some film that it's historian. fucking horrible. And so what happens is basically the first ten minutes of this movie are completely unnecessary. From the description of the incoming werewolf break that you already don't care about and are confused by its existence at the start. Why would I possibly mm -hmm. need this? And then you're told it's a werewolf movie, but then you see a guy getting hunted by other men, and you're like, I don't really know what the fuck's going on here because he's clearly not a werewolf. He's just a guy running around, and then it, it becomes an elaborate setup for his security system. But a movie that was actually well made and well written would have just, I don't know, described the security system and we would have fucking moved on with our lives and it wouldn't have taken 10 minutes to basically do a test run that we don't need to see. Mm. I mean, and listen, then, uh, and then it was at every action sequence. You you mentioned the car chase sequence. There is no is point. Terrible, yes. There is no point to this car chase sequence because at the end of it, he's like, "Were you trying to leave?" And the guy's like, "Ha ha, I was." And then they just go back to the house, and nothing happens. Where were you going? I was going to the village. You were trying to escape. Let's go back. Uh, this way, please. Yeah, Milton Sabotsky <laughs> inserted that because he said we need action. And the unfortunate part of the car chase is it's almost like in a Scooby-Doo episode where they're running in and out of the doors. It doesn't make yes. any sense geographically no. because Calvin Lockhart is in a Jeep. Uh, Michael Gambon is in a car that's faster than a Jeep. There is no world where Calvin Lockhart can catch Michael Gambon's car. And yet, somehow, <laughs> by driving away from the car, he's able to get in front of the car. Now, that obviously, you know, there are some problems with that element. I, I, won't, I won't lie. I wasn't a big fan of the car chase, so I, I'm not going to lie. I also these... hate the way the Jeep just pulls out in front of him and it, it also, stops. It's also just badly yeah. shot. I mean, all of yes, these action yes. sequences are terribly The car chases. The the, the 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 car chases. I dis I actually disagree with the opening sequence being. It's so shot. bad, they, dude. They're they're like they they're hired like a helicopter and backing monkey. through the forest and like the branches are just hitting him in the face. It looks cheap as fuck, yeah. man. It looks terrible. No, that's that's perfect. That's what you want. It's meant. It's like oh, I'm in the fuck. I'm I'm trying to escape. There's trees in everywhere. <laughs> the, they had that helicopter. Yo, that opening shot, man. That's fucking wicked. That, if you you had that in a modern movie, you got the a nice helicopter camera, on the moors. But they no, hired a terrible. real helicopter. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> they, they they set fire to that helicopter at the end, Monty. That was that. That's where the budget went. In, in case you're wondering, that's By why way, twenty minutes of this movie is the Calvin fact Lockhart that the dog the, the dog like made the helicopter explode is also one of the most hilarious parts of this movie. We, <laughs> sure. we, we we will we will we will talk about that. We will we will. That's get the to thing. The dog. I'm actually going to keep a lot of our roasting because it's mainly going to be for the section about guessing and that sort of thing. And did they cheat mm. or whatever? Because I have a lot of thoughts on that that i don't think that's where the movie yes. falls down very Certainly. badly essentially yeah. it's it's a cheaply done part of the script where spoiler it you weren't ever allowed to guess who it was so we'll get to that no, later. there's no clues but, no. if you want to do like actual things i didn't think were that bad yeah. the one of the best scenes i actually think by the way i actually think in the opening when he's just explaining the premise and you meet each of the characters isn't bad like no, like fine. obviously peter cushion kills it michael gambo kills it like michael Grace. these guys are really good uh, but i actually thought the scene where pavel gets killed is cool because remember the premise there is he's supposed to be the person who left yeah. his country because he doesn't believe in the concept of superstition etc yeah. and so then he's almost like the fucking person who's sort of like 
it's almost like the priest in Salem's lot. He's like, oh, I don't, I'm, I'm going to be fine because like I'm protected. And then when actually is quite a cool scene where he gets killed by the yeah. werewolf. And Into then, the game. Except yeah. when it remember, jumps through the skylight. That's fine. <laughs> Now, Remember, listen. the point here is that you're just looking at a dog again. If that was a werewolf, this, here's a concept people won't understand. And spoiler, this is actually very relevant to the modern day when everyone can't shut the fuck up about guns in America. Is you know when people see footage and go, "Why didn't you just neutralize him by shooting his leg?" Right? There's a concept in guns that go like this. Now, I, I read a lot about this because I was trying to read about how knives work and what knife crimes like. And what they said is, in the military when they do knife training, even if you have a gun, they tell you if you let the person get close enough, you will definitely get stabbed so you have to literally neutralize them before they can even get to you like essentially mm. because if you don't know how like a Glock works for example that doesn't like a movie shoot you backwards that's not a thing first of all and then secondly it doesn't one shot just kill the person like they can just keep no. coming at you and the problem is if they can close the distance the knife is better than the gun I know people don't yep. get that concept but it is so essentially the premise here is this is why actually the dog not being big enough is the problem if it was a giant <laughs> werewolf actually by the way you would have a very hard time shooting it with a rifle you wouldn't have do nothing with it as a man unarmed by the way you'd be fucked completely like as soon as it gets within like x meters of you you'd be done that would be game over now they didn't do yeah. a good job sadly of presenting that in this film so i agree it ends up just being he stands there the dog jumps and it kills him but like you could you conceptually you could have made that good you know i thought that was yeah. like a decent concept yeah so look, i want to talk about right one, one of the things i haven't really got to yet is uh, why i picked this movie and why i think right. it's like one of those one of those things i have a soft spot for so i want to talk a little bit about horror history which is my thing right <laughs> i actually did uh when i was doing my degree at university there's a thing you do before your dissertation which is kind of like the run-up to the dissertation you do these like uh extended essays i guess would be a way of putting it and i did mine on how horror is the best movie genre if you want to know what the zeitgeist was from any period in history you look at what people were afraid of now that doesn't mean all horror movies are just a reflection of fears or indeed all horror movies are scary and this movie is in no way scary uh, but what it represents is kind of interesting so the beast must die right here it is right so hammer horror took the universal pictures the classic monster movies they got the rights to essentially rework them and Hammer horror they was a british company by the way guys just so i'm trying Correct. to provide context here <laughs> no it's important uh and and what they did was they wanted to make a more this is in the 50s so 57 uh is the curse you're also gonna have to be much more you're all, yes you're gonna be much more explicit and say like the universal monsters were like you know, Frankenstein, Dracula. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah okay. Oh, so they don't yeah. know. Right, Frankenstein, Dracula. I'm trying to make this uh, as basic mummy, as possible. Yeah, Mummy, Wolfman, uh, Wolfman uh, uh, Creature from the Black Lagoon. The Creature from the Black Lagoon. Right, so all of that. They got the rights to essentially remake these movies, and they did. And they were considered at the time to be deeply, deeply shocking because they were they brought blood to the table. Yeah. It was in color. It was in color. So for the 50s, people were like, holy shit. So Hammer... Uh, Hammer had this insane run where and like say, a lot of Hammer's famous seven. films were the Christopher Lee Dracula and movies. Peter Cushing. Uh, Peter Cushing. Cushing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In in the same way that Bella Lugosi, Boris Karloff were kind of yes, synonymous with exactly. Universal, Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing are synonymous with Hammer. They were their go-to actors. They're in all of these films. So you had there the curse of Frankenstein. They also remade Dracula. This is uh, their their Dracula interpretation, which comes up in '58. They spun Dracula into a fran franchise, including stuff like Dracula, Prince of Darkness. Brides of da Dracula, Taste the Blood of Dracula. But where Hammer Horror gets really interesting is in the 60s. Now, in the 60s, they start being a bit more experimental and they make some, like, really interesting movies. Movies, I think, hold up today. The Plague of Zombies is fucking fantastic. Strong, strong recommend there. Rasputin, The Mad Monk as well, also starring Christopher Lee. That's a low-key a banger. Then you have, obviously, The Reptile. That's also a banger. The Devil Rides Out is a fucking modern horror classic. In fact, one that we've already alluded to uh, on, on, the, on the podcast. So they made all of these fucking fantastic movies, but here's the problem. 
you get to the 70s, the swinging London scene starts kicking in. And then it's like Hammer Horror kind of loses its mojo. Stop me if you've heard this one before. They remake all of their classics, and what they end up doing is they start gender swapping the roles. So you end up with Sister Dracula. You end up with uh, Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde was another one. Um, they're as terrible as they sound. So they were on a collision course to Annihilation, which ended with quite conceivably the worst horror movie they ever made, which is the... <laughs> The Legend of the Seven Golden Vampires, which, by the way, if if anyone wants to watch this, you will truly see what a terrible horror movie can look like because this was where they said, hey, those kung fu movies are, are popping off over in China. So they Sounds did a collaboration great. with the the Shaw brothers that made, like, you know, yeah, yeah, all of it's those. The most like, of all time. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and by the way, just it's Peter Cushing, guys. He's still in it. Peter oh. Cushing was still ride or die <laughs> in this vampire. He check this cut, can he? <laughs> he? Mate, whenever there's a Van Helsing-style character to be played, that motherfucker was, was indeed there. <laughs> now, what's, also, what's interesting is just as Hammer Horror are losing their mojo and dropping off, a young upstart production headed up by Milton Zabotsky, who I've already talked about a lot, who was the producer of this movie and interfered and was the mad genius behind the werewolf break, a production company called Amicus comes up, late 60s, I believe this was 67's The Torture Garden, and what they started doing was they started making incredible portmanteau um, horror films, which a lot of people mistakenly believe are hammer horror movies. Uh, the House That Drip Blood, things like this. The greatest portmanteau, that's Cushing again, uh, ever, one of my personal favourites, Asylum. This is right up there with Dead and Night, I think, is the greatest horror portmanteau of all time. Uh, really, really recommend it. Um, and so they had this incredible pedigree, and they got a lot of attention. They got a lot of attention just as hammer horror was dropping off. And so, 1974, they're still trying trying to be like how the fuck can we take that torch and take that mantle and this is why amicus movies are kind of a bit more experimental and crazy and so this is how you end up with a black exploitation murder mystery werewolf movie in the 70s starring calvin lockhart and this is why for me this movie is mega mega interesting in terms of the history of horror because we were still a long way from the 1980 reboot with the House of Hammer Horror, which, by the way, is also fucking fantastic. All 13 episodes are great, including the legendary house that bled to death. So all of that is to say this movie is a time capsule, a time capsule for trends, a time capsule for the history of horror, a representation of how experimental horror was uh, getting at this time. And this was meant to be like a genre movie. This is the type of thing you would have gone to see, you know, in a cinema. Nobody did, by the way. It completely bombed. In fact, this was Amicus's last horror movie. <laughs> it effectively <laughs> killed the fucking studio. But it is a fantastic time capsule, I think, representative of all of the trends uh, where we are. And it's not until, as I said, in the 80s, we get kind of a reboot of horror and Hammer and uh, Amicus and these kind of traditional werewolves and vampires and mummies and zombies. These kind of all fall by the wayside and we start moving into a much more interesting time in the 80s with body horror and other types of things. But The Beast Must Die represents essentially the last hurrah of traditional horror monsters. That's why. Well, that's one of the reasons why I love this film. Not selling Can we you, skip to the Roasting Monty? <laughs> Go on. Because here's the area. I, I, this is where I have a big beef with this film, which is I've referenced it. I'll, I'll no doubt I've probably said this seven times in this uh, and four play at different times because it is my go to philosophy for how you do detective slash mystery films. I will always reference this because this, I actually I've watched a lot of them in my life, and especially as I've gotten older, because I'm someone who has a good memory, etc. And I've seen a lot of these films, I get really good at figuring out the blueprint. And, the, and essentially, it's why I've always actually revered Agatha Christie. She's one of the only people that can consistently get me and make me pick the wrong person and not get the right one. All the mainstream shit you do, I can tell you, I have done some mental ones. 10 minutes in I've just I don't do it where I say every person's in I've done it 10 minutes in it's got it's that person because mm. it, I could infer they'd be the second least most likely and, you do, and I can just do it that way I can figure out the formula right so I always say this one thing on the show you've heard it before which is the legendary um, writer Raymond Chandler famously said 
that you never lie to the audience. Essentially, mm. what he's sort of saying is you have to play it fair. You have to be good enough as a writer to give me the hints where it's possible I could have guessed, but you never showed me anything nonsense. And at the end, if he did a great job like Agatha Christie, I didn't guess it, which is why it's so satisfying. But then when you, when I see who it is, I'm going to go, oh, and I'm going to realise all those scenes that actually did mean something I didn't infer. Now, the problem this film has is, if you don't understand, guys, the reason he makes that critique is the way a lot of crap directors in horror will do it is they'll just show you a lie. They'll just show you a scene that wasn't real or was like, he hallucinated that, but they don't tell you it's hallucination or, you know, some bollocks like that or some, or the worst one ever is like, I, I don't know if I should give a spoiler to a film we're not even going to watch. Right, basically, there's a film I once saw where I'll tell Rich what it is later, but it's like if, it was a popular uh, it was a, it was a big movie in the 90s, right? And basically, it's one like this where there's like a serial killer, and at the end, no joke, the serial killer was just the doctor that saw him at the beginning of the movie for five minutes and it had nothing to do with the rest of the plot. So, that my point is in that film, yeah, you're going to be really shocked. You'll never guess it's that doctor, but it's impossible to guess. There's no reason to, there's no clue. So, basically, my problem here is this, Richard, as soon as it starts the film, like you're gonna have to guess who the werewolf was and then you dare to throw that scene in telling me now can you guess because guess what i put my mind to it i didn't like i never looked anything up online i never cheated and went forwards so here's my problem i'll show you how you figure out who it is because actually this is where everyone who isn't agatha christie often fucks up so first things first we'll go through all the characters right you have the peter cushing character who's the doctor he's called yep. fucking What's his name here? Let me quickly find it. He's called Dr. Lundgren. And Lundgren. he's the one who even says like his passion is stuff like cannibalism he's an and shit like that. And we're, but being werewolf his, and not. Yeah, his, his And basically side, the reason you can immediate the reason you can immediately eliminate him is it would be actually the worst decision ever to put the most famous wolfman ever as a werewolf. So even though in <laughs> theory you should have considered everyone a suspect. It would actually be the worst ending ever if he is that. Not least because he's the one giving you all the ways that you detect a werewolf. Like, that would be the worst strike ever. So immediately, I can eliminate him. Then secondly, I can instantly eliminate the character Paul Foote. Because not only is his setup absurd, like, his isn't even just Richard people are dying. His is like, you've done cannibalism, and you were once there in a place where the person <laughs> died. Then you decided to paint a picture, which was a devil eating him, and the face was the victim. And then he's even doing stuff like, like, oh, I've got hairy hands now. I can't remember. Was his hands hairy before? You'd think you'd notice that, mate. The whole <laughs> film's about you trying to catch this con. So that one, by the way, he's essentially also constantly the one that's suspected, right? He's just So that one, I can already tell you, he's not it. And in fact, it's even obvious he'll die at some point in the film. That's just an obvious thing, if you know how you do the... Because for everyone who's too dumb and thinks, oh, it must be him drunk of the hands. Like, that guy's going to get tricked and subverted by him not being it at the end, right? Then you go through, so you have the Peter Gambon character, who was the I think he's the maestro, right? Isn't he the one who's going to like... Uh, yeah, yeah, he's the, the, the yeah, yeah, he's Gambon, that's, yeah. So basically, the reason why he's interesting and I immediately thought he might be it is because early on, first of all, he doesn't have any really, anything suspicious about him. He's, he's playing it like a really chill guy. And the, the, the giveaway there, if you know when people are like trying to do this style, if you can't guess it, but they're not as good as they think they are, is the scene early on where he just uses childhood playground reverse psychology. He just goes, if you want, I'll just stay. And they can all go, I'll stay here. You let the others go. Who are you trying to protect? Davina? Is it Davina? Bro, if you want the werewolf, what would the point in that be? What would the point in that be? What would the, and, and the trick to di misdirect you, which is shit, is just, but I'll do it for that woman, which is what obviously that guy's sort of inferring, like you're doing it for that woman. So already I have him marked on my list, Richard, major suspect there, because I'm not get, they're not giving me anything for this guy. In fact, if anything, they're making him seem like he's sacrificing himself, isn't he? He must be the good guy, because how would he say to do it? Essentially, it's like the scene in the movies in Hollywood, do it, motherfucker, do it, and then they never shoot you because you said that. Even though real life spoiler, don't try that. That will definitely get you killed. <laughs> so there's the one, right? I already have him marked down, but you can see where I'm going here, because if you know how the movie ends, you're going to know that this is way think of the other ones you have bennington the guy who was like the delegate and people kept dying right the problem mm. with him is they just actually don't do enough with his character he's the one they seem to just leave out i think there almost should have been an extra scene for him they do fuck all with his character he just has to die for some bizarre reason and so you go through you have davina who's the hot woman right i can already tell you she's definitely not it because she's just acting scared the whole time but in a way that like if she was a really bad actress the werewolf it'd be her wouldn't it so i can already eliminate her then if you go through one thing i i personally did because i've just seen too many of these films 
knows where they try and trick you. It's, I did put a little note down. There's a side chance they try and just make it the Pavel guy because one, he's not a suspect. Yeah, and I thought two, that might be the case too. He doesn't believe it, and he and he escaped his country because he doesn't believe that shit. I understood they were very common in your country. That is one of the reasons I left my country. Why I escaped to England, away from a mentality which believes in such things. That would be like, but okay, that's like, that's a, I'd give you a half marks for that. Well, that wouldn't be too bad. But obviously he dies, doesn't he, quite like halfway through the film, yeah, so yeah. it can't be him. Well, it Here's wouldn't make my sense problem. with the premise, though, because he invited, the idea is that, well, how would he have known that Pavel was the, or could have been a werewolf, because everyone else he invited very specifically... No, no. You're, you're, you're imagining that's a, a movie that makes sense, Monty. If it's oh, a bad sorry. movie, that's absolutely possible. <laughs> sorry, you know what I mean? Okay, if sorry. it's badly written, <laughs> again, bad. if you want to cheat, if you want to cheat, that's actually a really good way to do it, Monty. You, you actually violate the principle at the beginning. Then yeah, all, okay. obviously, all you right, can't guess. Then I'll quickly go to this last one, which is the the other one is, a, and this is a part that they don't even infer in the movie, which is very silly, is they don't ever infer in the movie it could be his girlfriend, which, by the way, in itself is absurd. This is why it's cheating what they do at the end. Because again, Monty, how could his girlfriend be there if it's all the other thing, right? But this is where they cheat because this is where they actually cheat by showing you something on screen and doing two or three things. Right. So basically, you've all seen the film at this point or you're never going to see it. So at the end, it's Michael Gambon. It's Jan, right? <laughs> now, this is why it's mental that it is him, even though he was my major guess. Because they throw a red herring in partway through the movie in a scene when the black guy's going through the woods. They show someone with literally black hands holding a fucking bow and arrow. You can pause it. They have, there's only one other black person on the island, and it's his girlfriend, right? But they then assume you're not as sharp as me. You'll think that's a shadow. And they quickly throw in a red herring of the poor fuck guy, a totally white guy. At least give me a chance. Make it a Mexican or something for folks' sake. <laughs> so you show, you told me a different direction, a totally different guy who coincidentally fires an arrow like, oh. and so basically here's the problem. In that moment, as you're going to find out after the break, it's going to be his girlfriend, isn't it? But this is where they cheated a second time and this is unforgivable. Yep. Because do you know the most mental part that makes no sense, Monty? Is think about how fucking explicit Peter Cushing's character was about telling you all the... There's wolf spirit, but that doesn't even grow here. Why you mention it yep. then, Con? Oh, magically, he's got some. There's a silver. They do that. Do it once, motherfucker. I don't know, keep, they keep doing, doing scenes so with the good. silver. I, was get I know. To that. You I know love that. It. You have the. So you have all this, right? And here's the problem, Monty. Oh, he just forgot to mention, but if you get bit by the werewolf, you sort of become one as well, but you're not the original one. So they cheated. Even though I actually would have guessed yep. Jan, Richard, obviously, because yep. I haven't been told that vital piece of information, which would be the first thing you'd say before passing, Don't before going, you know what, the werewolf. <laughs> because that's so vital, it means that obviously when I see those hands, I think I've got it. It's his girlfriend, which it kind of is, but it isn't. So that part, I can All fuck right. with so much in the rest so, of this film, but that part offended me, sir. I, so, I so do not accept that for, part. The, for those of you guys who didn't wa watch this, there is the werewolf break. And what the werewolf break is, is they say, and now it is the werewolf break. You have 30 seconds to make your guess. And then the clock literally just sits there ticking for 30 seconds in a very annoying like fashion. <laughs> <laughs> Which is hilarious, by the way. And like, I feel like yep. werewolf break is just going to become a meme on this show of when nothing is happening, right? <laughs> Listen, <laughs> it's, it's the thing. If you could, if you couldn't already guess, what would you do in that 30 seconds? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. what do you, don't yeah. even the game clue, you need like 10 minutes or something. Like, what do you, you wouldn't ever be able to infer it. I couldn't get to the 20th warrior <laughs> would have been way better if it had a werewolf. Okay? I'm just putting that in. A, a, uh, caveman, putting a that caveman break? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Let's guess. Let's guess <laughs> who's going to kill the queen. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, anyway, so, yeah. uh, but basically what happens for you guys who didn't watch this is that during the, after the werewolf break, it shows that his girlfriend, his wife or whatever is the, in fact a werewolf because she touches the silver and her hands start turning hairy and whatever. Oh. <laughs> 
even though that also didn't make sense because it that said, makes no sense. It said she was gonna die, but she doesn't get poisoned. She just starts turning into a werewolf. Also, so I don't even Monty, know what the fuck this that is was about. this is why that's also cheap. Because look, it is true. The moment she starts to turn the hair, you do think, well, she was always against it. She was the one trying to like constantly find ways of people out. But here's what makes no sense as well. The moment they tell you, we're now going to one by one pass silver things to put in your mouth. Yes. If you are the werewolf, just kill them already. Go mental. There's no <laughs> point actually taking it. Because she almost does it as if, here's what's mad. This is the most mental concept ever. I almost feel like, like the, a woman wrote this part of the film. Because essentially, the implication is, even though she is the werewolf, she's sort of like, well, since you mistrust me, I'll show you. Oh, I actually am the werewolf. I'm dead now. <laughs> <laughs> Makes, well, that makes she didn't, no to be, to be fair, sense at she all. She had just turned into a werewolf and probably was like committing suicide. Uh, you know what I mean? Still metal, though. Oh, so Still metal. She wasn't the original she really werewolf. Loved, she really loved. She anyway, really loved Calvin. Anyway, so that what happens he's, is he's a beautiful man. He's so okay, good so looking. Hold up, I have to actually describe just, what happens she, here. She loved him. <laughs> tell him he was right, though. He was actually right that there was a werewolf there. Remember, half the premise of the movie is everyone else doesn't believe there's werewolves. Right. Like she doesn't so, even go. By the way, I am right. one. So turn it, you're right, bitch. She just sort of goes up. Oh, also, she could have just said like she could have just said. I mean, the thing is, she might not have even known she was a werewolf because she just got turned right, which is. She didn't, she didn't remember getting bitten. Oh, I guess it was in the blood on the hand. It was in the blood. She didn't yeah, even that's know. That's, that's the yeah, funny thing okay. is she yeah. didn't even know. Okay, so enough. anyway, oh, let, let me explain okay. what actually happened. So his wife like starts turning into a werewolf, which is also against the rules of the movie set because yep. it wasn't like if you touch silver, you turn yep. into a werewolf. It's if you touch silver, you are poisoned and die. She doesn't get poisoned and Pete die. Cushion She's... was just a hack, man. Like he didn't know what the fuck he was talking about. <laughs> that's he, got some yeah. fucking, he got some Mickey Mouse werewolf degree from <laughs> Mickey Mouse University. He didn't know what he was talking about. From no. Trump University. Exactly. Werewolfology from Trump University. Anyway, uh, but it, she starts turning into werewolf, and then uh, Calvin Lockhart just shoots her with a silver bullet. But it turns out that she Doesn't may not hesitate. have even known that she was a werewolf because there was a fight between the werewolf and their dog. It killed the dog. The werewolf bit the dog. The blood then got into the blood in a wound she had on her hand. And that's what turned her into yep. werewolf. But the weir real werewolf was Michael Gambit. It was Jan the whole time. So they, they do this like ridiculous pump fake on you. Double werewolf. <laughs> double werewolf. More werewolf what, for what, your money. Dude. The <laughs> classic double but werewolf I want, for a I want to one. talk about some things that Thorin alluded to here that were also hilarious. So if, if you guys watched along with us for the thing, it's a very similar, it's not an inventive yeah. scene, but it's like the, it's similar to the blood test scene in the thing yeah, where yeah. they're all sitting around, like trying to figure out who the thing is. Except as Thorin said, they pass around a silver candlestick and then nothing happens. And then Peter Cushing mm. goes, well, of course, course that it's only because there isn't any wolfsbane and it reminds me of that um that simpsons uh that simpsons bit about the northern lights it's like at the wolfsbane at this time of year localized entirely within your greenhouse so there's no there's supposed to be no wolfsbane but calvin lockhart has some that, by the way. Well, yeah. and then yeah, so yeah. they reference yeah you did and it, what the the most ridiculous part of this guys is so they spend an entire scene passing around a, ca a candlestick which is by the way boring as fuck Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's they're literally just passing around a silver candlestick. And then what does Calvin Lockhart do? He goes out, goes to his greenhouse, pulls out some wolfbane, and then he just like puffs it around the room in what is uh, just hilariously anticlimactic. And then they just keep going back to touching the candlestick for like the rest of the fucking movie. Half this movie is just touching the candlestick or putting silver things in your mouth. It's horrible. Well, no, yeah, there's an even a worse part, Monty, which is not, not only could you right. just leave it after the wolf's you already did the candlestick. But in the second <laughs> candlestick scene, it's even stupider <laughs> because there's another thing where I can This is I an hour and a movie like that through. has two candlestick scenes. In the, in the second candlestick scene, he actually only has one person touch it. He gives it to one person. Yes. The Paul Foot guy who a million times has proved he's not a fucking werewolf, you dickheads. And then what happens is that other guy goes like sort of like, oh, uh, more reverse psych a different character goes, more reverse psychology, but uh, couldn't be me. And then he just sort of goes, Well, I'm not fucking giving you it then. And it's like, what? The premise was everyone has to touch it. But then when they skip to the end on the werewolf reveal, they go, We all touched it. Even though they didn't, like the second time, just one block touched it, and then he let them all off. Like well, I mean, it, it, that's what I mean. The execution of the film is where it, it falls. It would, but it, it I was just like, it is. I, I would just like, well, how difficult is it to find this fucking werewolf? Because you're like, oh, it didn't work the first time. Oh, now the wolf's bane's here. So let's just all do, I don't know, exactly the same thing again and figure out how the wolf, who the werewolf is. No, they just for like forget about it one so eighth again, of the way through the why, scene. 
Why would the werewolf ever accept to hold the thing that proves, you know what I mean? You just run out the room when it's your turn at that point. You know what I mean? Look, look maybe you wait, Richard, like that, and you see if someone else does some stupid move and he stops doing it. But you don't, you would never actually go, yeah, pass it to me. Like, that, that's the part of the concept that's, again, you're cheating because you're letting everyone go, oh, I'm fine doing it, no problem. Like, fuck off, fuck off. I just, I just love that there was a scene where he's just like, shaking like pollen at, around a yeah. room it's just like puffs of it's so lame it's so fucking lame. like what a lame device also richard's right you know why richard's right because actually every single thing peter cushing says doesn't really work like even what's supposed no. to happen with that pollen like how it doesn't really affect you the way it should like essentially <laughs> no. all the things that detect you don't work and by the way at the end don't worry because because that's going to be one of our themes on these shows boys at the end if you want i'll give you thorin's director's cut version where i change the ending and make it better i actually but like the wait, it's all good I, no, I've got a, I've got, listen, I've got another better ending, but it's all we got. Josh, I'll do it now. Yeah, we're gonna say I think, well, okay, uh, here's the ending. Here's the ending for those that don't know. Right, he fights the werewolf. By the way, there are, there are some problematic elements in the movie. I'll just put this out here, out here now in, because uh, the dog was so lovable. The dog they cast as the werewolf, it was a dog called Sultan, I believe. And it was so lovable, it wouldn't fight people. It would just like oh, lick them, and, right? So the only person that they could get to the dog to like wrestle with and tussle with was the trainer and uh so they had and the trainer was a white guy so he played calvin lockhart in the scenes and they did black him up which is <laughs> so when you see when you see those Classic. scenes of the werewolf fighting calvin lockhart that is someone in blackface when you're putting that out Anyway, shot from the back though, so it's tastefully done or whatever. I don't fucking know. No, obviously it was the seventies. It was a lot of problems with that. But anyway, so um, yeah, what ends up happening is he wrestles with the dog, the werewolf. Sorry, the werewolf bites him. He doesn't realize he's been bit. He sits down, and Peter Cushion goes, "Are you hurt?" And he goes, "No, just bruised." And then of course there's blood. It's like <laughs> that, that makes no sense, bro. There's like blood all down his shirt, just bruised. Uh, no, no, no. You know, like, you rip it because Calvin Lockhart. He's just ripped even the him. idea he would wouldn't be bitten. He's wrestling yeah. physically on him yeah, with the way. Oh, oh shit, it's this werewolf, bro, if he's not bitten. <laughs> yeah. like, he has to be. Yeah. He has to be. It wasn't a great one. Um, and then he rips the shirt open and uh, he's, he's been bit and uh, he like on his, on his yeah, shoulder. He, yeah he, he gets the gun and he and he walks in and Davina's going but there must be a cure I know, I know. A, Peter, a, a Peter Cushing goes there is only one my child and then you just hear you just hear the gunshot go off and Peter call the Cushing. There is only one cure. Two things. One, yeah. Peter Cushing obviously just does exactly what you'd expect. If you don't know, for, look, at least you Zoomers will know him as Grand Moff Tarkin, which, by the way, not only is actually one of the best performances in Star Wars, but as people yes. always point out, essentially, if the Empire had just been run by Grand Moff Tarkin, not Darth Vader and the Palpatine, they'd have just succeeded. They would have just, like, yeah. worked, ruled the universe. <laughs> he actually seemed like an incredible managerial class individual. He also had, like, the stern, you know, militaristic... Prussian style of late. He just actually killed it, didn't he? But obviously, as Richard says, he is the Wolfman most famously from the Hammer Horror movies. So that's obviously what they're trying to lead to here. Here's yeah. what my special ending would be. And this would make this, this would redeem this movie. In fact, this is what the Twilight Zone episode would be. The whole thing would be because the premise of the film is there's this like you say, potentially ropey hired guy who's an expert on werewolves. And then there's the Calvin Lockhart guy who's definitely sure it's a werewolf, but no one else thinks there's werewolves. Everyone else for the whole movie until little part, die. even when they're dying, they don't even 100% believe it. Like that, if you notice, there's nothing that doesn't make sense about the film. People are dying and getting their throats ripped out in a way that like a werewolf would. But then all the others are still sort of like, oh, why are we still trying to prove who's the werewolf? Like, oh. <laughs> no, no, do you want to live? Do you want to live? You either leave or you acknowledge as well. So here's where I would have had my twist my twist would have been this because every single time calvin lockhart's character is chasing down another character to see if they're the werewolf they're always on their own it's just them and the other guy right i would have had it at the end where there was no werewolf the reveal was he has actually just gone mad from being paranoid like you could make him like a fucking howard hughes type billionaire guy who sat in his home thinking about werewolves and basically at the end what you find is like in those scenes they didn't show you part and it was never a werewolf it was just him shooting each of the people and he was just hallucinating that they were the werewolf. I think that would be a fucking killer ending. That would that would be the banger Twilight Zone ending of like 
Imagine a world where a man thought that he was a wolf, and in the end, he was the hunter that was the. You know, you know that fucking Rod Serling. He would have done that. It would have. Yeah. It would have played out to the applause at the end. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, it's not, it's not bad. I, I actually think the ending is one of the stronger elements of the film. Um, no. I, 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 like, I, don't know I mean, I wonder the, I was wondering about the mechanics of trying to kill yourself with a hunting, a bolt action hunting rifle that long, but you know, only Calvin Lockhart is manly enough to do it. He's <laughs> got really long <laughs> arms. <laughs> I did also laugh. I did also laugh when he just points that barrel. And, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that'd be better if you did the old. Can I? Can I? Can I? Can I ask you what you thought of the soundtrack? I was going to say, the amazing. soundtrack is a classic yeah. black exploitation soundtrack. Yes, That's actually is. really it's like good. Funk. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Or it's like New Orleans it, jazz listen, and I funk. Actually listen, <laughs> quickly, because it's no lyrics. I could listen to that soundtrack like now. Yeah, just yeah. Like, yeah. I'm it it, it, it is fantastic. Yeah. It's really heavily influenced by like the Isaac Hayes, you know, kind of right. style that they, they, they employed in Shaft. You can hear it. It's got the funk, waka waka guitars yeah. and oh, the horns hats. and everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The sound The soundtrack is actually fantastic as well. Um, even in the parts where it's like trying to build tension and it's got that bass do 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 and it's like Calvin Lockhart in the woods running around for 20 minutes um, but yeah so so things things I love about the movie soundtrack is great soundtrack is S tier I'm gonna say that uh, ending is strong P uh, uh, character actors get great dialogue right uh, the the bit where Paul Foot says to the other dude who dies whose name I can't remember off the top of my head and uh, he goes, yes, uh, I'm into painting myself. I kind of do this thing. It's called agro art. You take whips <laughs> and you lash at the canvas. And he's just there with like a cognac. And he goes, I'm more of a landscape man myself. <laughs> that, that was and very fucking... funny. I laughed at that. <laughs> yeah, you see? You see? It's called agro art. You cover a canvas with paint. Express your creative aggression by beating it with different sizes of whip. I'm a landscape man myself. There, there are some <laughs> great little one-liners. And unfortunately, as I said, the problem the movie really has is Paul Annette thought he was directing one film. He thought he was directing a werewolf mystery. He really thought he was doing that. And if the movie had been that, and you take out the... I agree that the, the opening scene is overly yeah, so, long. Why, why tell us it's definitely a werewolf? That's actually a really yeah. that's actually a flaw to the movie for real. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And 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 adding adding the opening fucking you're about to see the a werewolf murder mystery where you're <laughs> so the detective. Terrible. There will it's be like, a werewolf break. Yeah, the, like, yeah, yeah we and, promise also, there will be a werewolf also and a werewolf raises, break. Ra raises questions yeah. because the old first thing I was like, I was like, okay, what the fuck is a werewolf break? <laughs> but but, but Here's here's the thing. I do wonder in retrospect, even though Paul and that hated that, and he and, and and it was added without his knowledge, permission, instruction. Um, I do wonder if anyone would even remember this film if it wasn't for the werewolf. Oh, break. right, the that, inherent the absurdity. Part, right. Yeah, the inherent sure. absurdity of the werewolf break. Because whenever I talk to people who've seen this movie, because there was actually a cut of this film that was released without the werewolf break and without the intro, and it, it was called, again, somewhat problematically, Black Werewolf. <laughs> like, well, <laughs> like, I mean, it don't know about that one. literally true. The werewolf is black. Yeah, yeah but the there's two black people in the film <laughs> and one of them's hunting the werewolf. So don't call it that. And just also, a black werewolf i don't know uh, have you this isn't actually a traditional black exploitation movie in that sense it's not being made by black people so anyway um you know the, the the would anyone have remembered it if the werewolf break wasn't in it probably not actually i think the thing that elevates it above a lot of the like 70s genre fodder is the fact it just has this absurd thing that 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 it was a direct copy of um there was a another movie uh it was called uh what what is it it had the fright break it was a ripoff of psycho hang on i'm gonna i'm gonna have to look this up because my brain's oh, all right homicidal homicidal they one go. homicidal uh they basically after 1960 psycho uh, they made a movie called Homicidal, and it was a classic William Castle. For all who don't know, William Castle was this movie producer who made American movies that all had gimmicky premises, like he did, like uh, quite famously, The Tingler with uh, Vincent Price. And when you sat in chairs, it gave you like an electric shock and stuff like this. The Tingler's in the cin it would announce the Tingler's in the cinema, and you oh no, and then the, the chair would shock you. He did all this stuff uh, to make kind of uh, the cinematic experience more immersive 
immersive and interactive, and all of his films had gimmicky premises. In 1961, he makes, uh, he produces rather a movie called Homicidal which was designed to capitalize on this new emerging, oh my God, like serial killer movies, like Psycho was quite shocking for 1960. And it includes a fright break, which it, the movie stops and it says, it, shit's about to get real. <laughs> like it just says that. It's like, the movie is about to get really scary. If you want to leave now, you can get a refund in the foyer. And so they took that premise from 1961's Homicidal and basically Milton Zabotsky, he wanted to be a modern day William Castle and he puts it in the film. I, I, I think without the werewolf break, guys, we're probably not talking about this film. I might not even have come across it. I don't know. Even someone as kind of nerdy about horror as me, I uh, probably would have. But I mean, I, I, I just love the idea of the werewolf break. I think I, I, I would like more films to just break the fourth wall and talk to the audience in a really abrupt fashion. They should just do it. Like the opening scene is what ruins it. Now, imagine if they'd not did the opening scene telling you there was a werewolf break and there was just a werewolf it would be break way better at the end. If it, if it didn't that would be way better, right? Scene. Wouldn't it? Yes. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Uh, the opening scene essentially does spoil the film. Uh, a little bit, uh, but the rest, the rest of it's gold. I told you, gold. <laughs> um, look, I, my other problem with this is that, like I was alluding to earlier, it really, unfortunately, draws very much on like m previous material that's like way oversaturated in terms of pop culture and literature. Because there's, and then there were none. Is is probably. One, it maybe it's Agatha Christie's most well-known novel, although maybe not anymore because we've we've got the new uh, like Hercule Poirot uh, movies with Kenneth mm -hmm. Branagh that are coming out right now, and certainly like uh, what it was it the the death of Roger Ackroyd. Um, then there were none. Death on the Nile. Um, these mm -hmm. these books are very well known, but it's among them. And like this is where that book is where the trope of all the people being invited to the mysterious weekend at the manor comes from. Um, and so it's like very obviously derivative of that. And as I mentioned earlier, it's very obviously derivative of a short story called The Most Dangerous Game, which is a, a short story from the 20s. I forget who wrote it off the top of my head, but it's basically been done yeah. or re that story has been rewritten like a bazillion times in different ways. And the concept of that story is um, there's a man who gets the basic concept is there's a man who gets shipwrecked onto this island in the Caribbean. And on that island is a is a Russian guy who is like, basically invites him and the man who shipped Greg is a famous hunter himself. And then there's this Russian guy there who basically traps people on this Island to hunt them because they are the most dangerous game. Right. And so it's about hunting people and it mm. is, it is so like, you know, it's the exact basic premise of this where it's like, there is a big game hunter who is in this mansion trapping people and trying to hunt a werewolf. So it's basically like a perfect mishmash of both of these things, uh, except it's really boring. Is the just problem. on the dangerous game thing, because obviously that's like a classic. I do just want to point out to everyone: they remade the dangerous game the in the nineties. Most dangerous 90s. game. <laughs> yeah, they remade the most dangerous game in the nineties. They made a film called Surviving the Game, oh, which God. just if this does if this doesn't whet your appetite to watch it, the cast is Ice T, Rutger Hauer, and Gary Boosie. <laughs> Have you seen this? Oh yeah! Oh fucking! Oh, there's it. also some cocaine <laughs> casting right there. Yeah, right. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a just. For, that's for another episode, but that that exists. I, I am intrigued and, now. Everyone I must admit. Right now. Yeah. Uh, maybe, that is... maybe you know what? Here's here's an idea for you, Richard. Maybe we have an arc that is literally just the most dangerous game, and just do all the inter like because there's been a bazillion yeah. of these oh, interpretations sure. of the most dangerous game. It's been oh, it's, it's a pioneering like, film. If if you are if you are American, you probably read this like I did in high school. Um, it's mm. it's very common in like literature classes in the United States. Um, but it is bad and uh, hilarious. And also, I think a hundred years later after this story was written has kind of lost its luster in terms of the the idea behind it. So this this film just feels really worn out to me on arrival because I've read both of these things and I'm very familiar with the iterations that have taken place over the years of uh, both of and there were none and 
and the most dangerous game. And so for me, I'm yeah. just like, I'm kind of like rolling my eyes. And then on top of that, Richard, it's just boring. This movie is just horribly boring. Like you yeah, are- but a lot of a lot of a lot of horror movies, right? From back in right, you have to understand the 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 syncopation and the 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 pacing of the pacing is nonsense in this movie. <laughs> right. But that is that is not unique to the beast must die. The hor- <laughs> horror horror movies of this time what they what they do is because typically they were low budget so you would you would essentially be blowing your beans with the, the reveal of the monster often or an action sequence by the way we haven't even talked about calvin lockhart machine gun and a dog out of a helicopter i mean that was fucking <laughs> if you don't enjoy that sir you and then don't the dog enjoy making film. the helicopter blow up that was interesting yes that, that is <laughs> fucking great all of that is brilliant right that's like the high point in the movie that is obviously where the budget went because they <laughs> and then and they set fire to the helicopter quite literally and you can see well, that's even another same. mad thing about the film as well i also yeah. thought maybe they'd even play up the idea that he it's true there's a werewolf but he's gone too far getting it because you know in the first ever sequence where he gets attacked yeah they, remember this is mental guys he literally the werewolf goes past him oh except you don't see it, it's just a black object he turns around fires a bunch of shots with a rifle into the thing then on the comms goes did you see it or whatever and he goes no yeah. just a black thing so that's a different person yeah yeah, yeah. But we, yeah, but we don't Calvin. even dress that. Way. That's just left to like, yeah, don't worry about it. He's going to have to get the werewolf in the end anyway. Like, all right, cool. He could have just been killing was, people. What? The, the movie definitely would have been better if Calvin Lockhart had accidentally killed someone or something. Like, yeah. It would have not, would not have, have, six. Yeah. Yeah. It would, it would, because I mean, one, one thing I will say is another, another problem with this movie. There's only got a handful of problems, but they are quite <laughs> profound. It's really um, genius when you think about it, except it, for the it, problems. It is. I, 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 <laughs> when you, I, when I you agree. just focus on um, the concept, which sounds good, and then ignore the execution and everything about this movie, yeah. it's fucking incredible. Everyone <laughs> just takes the fact that they've gone out to Calvin Lockhart's house and he's essentially imprisoned them way too well. Yeah, like, yeah. other than Michael Gambon trying to drive away and the other guy going, well, I'll call the bloody police. <laughs> right? Other than that, no one really gives a fuck. Like, they just, just all like... Him. Listen, can we leave? We need to just knock out. It's yeah. like, no, you'd all just, like, grab him, tie him up. Like, we're off. Like, yeah, oh, we, yeah, we don't yeah, participate yeah. in this. We, we don't want to be part of the hunting of the dangerous game. That part doesn't yeah. make any sense to the yeah. premise. You're right. Like, yeah. they, 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 to do it? No, but they also just take it so well. Like, it's like, I don't care I how nice that red slab of beef uh, he, he he brought out for them, which by the way, I love the way that he puts out this. Every that, all that the food they well. serve in that scene, yeah, it's like bloody and, and red. It's like, dude, that really isn't cooked. That's not red. Oh, no, that looks um, really bad. Yeah, what what what's funny about that scene is that that dinner scene, which is brilliantly shot, Christopher. So take your insults <laughs> about the camera work <laughs> elsewhere. Uh, that is a brilliantly shot scene. Um, fantastically lit as well um what's interesting about that scene was it was shot over a week that dinner scene and they used i'm guessing because the budget wasn't particularly well they were using the same slab of beef oh, that's they, why it looks so uh, gross yeah so in the later <laughs> scenes it was literally a rotting stinky slimy slab of beef and all the actors have to go like Yes, delicious. You will notice as well, Peter Cushing was quite famously a vegetarian and uh, he only ate the cabbage. <laughs> if you watch the scene back, he doesn't he doesn't touch the beef at all, but maybe that was better for it. That that is what that scene is really good. I love all the interplay, but yeah, everyone just takes it too casually. Like like you have just effectively been imprisoned and held against your own will by a guy that you only kind of vaguely know. Like, he's not friends with any of these people. Exactly. That was the other thing is, like, yeah. why... It was never... The premise... The setup was never there. So it... um, And then there were none. Like, there is the whole explanation about the invitations that go out to the mansion. And, like, you know, there is a connectedness to these people um, that exists. But in this one, you don't even get the sense that Calvin Lockhart's character even actually knows all of the people. He definitely knows a couple of them. He doesn't but a couple of do them he just definitely he's... doesn't know. Here's the obvious angle you do. He's like a fucking rich guy. You make it like, and if you survive till the end and you're not a werewolf, you get $10 million. You know, if you could have done some angle right. where they have some motivation to want to like I be mean, there but not be the werewolf. But like, literally, I agree, uh, from day one, they should leave. A, a, a modern interpretation of this is obviously, um, what, Glass Onion, the Daniel Craig film. Yeah. Um, that came out. Magic. Yeah. Yeah, they're all uh, disruptors. Out, glass onion because it's the same concept guys except there it's mm. the the Elon Musk 
st- substitute guy who invites I, other people I, into the. I agree. Ryan island. Johnson was indeed inspired by the Beast Must Die. <laughs> I totally and definitely not. I, and then there were none. It was definitely the Beast Must Die. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Why do you keep calling um, it and then they're not instead of the original title? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, well, weird. <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to... I think I'm going to avoid that. Mind. Mind. I just believe in accuracy. I'll just believe in being part of the story. I mean, by, by the way, yeah. that title is so problematic, it got updated from its racist one with another racist yeah, one. It, 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 it did a it double was, racism. A double that, racism. The best part, uh, Richard, is that they were, they, uh, they were sort of begrudgingly doing it. Like, well, you know what? We'll, we'll meet you halfway. And then they went, no, it's not even loud either. I guess it's not loud. <laughs> Political <laughs> correctness got bloody <laughs> mad. Yeah, it's it. ridiculous. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I mean, look, um, uh, I, I suppose we should sort of wrap it up. I, I knew when I recommended this film, like, is this a film, you, you, like, A, would you ever have watched it? No. B, are you ever going to watch it again? No. C, is it even that good? No. Uh, D, <laughs> uh, is there any, does it, is it even important in any real meaningful sense? I'd sort of have to say no again. But... <laughs> Here's the, here's the key <laughs> aspect to it. Um, this is a film that is like, it, 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 it has some really boring and slow elements to it. But when it shines, it has that incredible like resonance and, and fun and silliness you can only get from that kind of, you know, that, that period of horror, which is, you know, ultimately everyone plays it unbelievably straight and it creates an adverting comedy. Yeah, yeah, yes. exactly. But, but that's, that's one thing looked... you didn't mention. The one thing you didn't mm. mention about Hammer Horror, actually, we should have done this at the beginning, is yeah. even though people like Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing are mega actors, by the way, they play it yeah. straight up. They, that's the reason yeah. why it's it's not that genius to cast fucking Christopher Lee in Star Wars and Lord no. of the Rings. It's obvious, <laughs> you idiot. You've actually got yeah. the scale now yes. where it would be appropriate because of yeah. the cheesy effects back in the day. The joke is, though, actually, they were half funny because they went into the realm of cheese, yes. didn't they? That was yeah, actually a key yeah. component of it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and obviously shocking at the time, but for a modern audience, that you can enjoy these movies on a different level sure. because yeah. you have these incredible classically trained actors yeah. essentially having to treat terrible dialogue and, and, and silly effects and silly premises. They have to treat it, well, they do treat it seriously, and it creates this nice little inconsistency in what yeah. you're seeing and hearing that I think, you know, it, 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 it's entertaining and enjoyable in and of itself. And I think, like, Calvin Lockhart swings for the fences in this film. This was one of his big features uh, that he got to do and sadly didn't get to do a lot more of them where he was he was the leading guy. You know, the way Milton Zabotsky viewed this movie was like, by the way, it, uh, Calvin Lockhart was Milton Zabotsky's casting. Paul Annette said some very uncharitable things about him. He said that Calvin Lockhart was out of his depth um, in terms of acting with this cast. And I don't feel that way at all. I think his performance no. is the best thing about the film. Um, uh, I like the fact that he only had two shirts, his black leather hunting shirt and then his like disco shirt with the silver w- w- squiggles on the front. Dude, it's so funny. <laughs> the costume is so funny. <laughs> his wardrobe is insane in this film. Like I, so when, when I was he's a kid. A, he is rich though. He is kind of bald. Yeah. That's kind of funny. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when, when, when I was a kid, I wanted so badly that shirt because if you look, the silver strips down the black shirt are all like moons and stars and it's, planets. It's and so seventies. Like, it's so funny. Yeah, yeah it's like exactly. Peak disco man. man. It's so good. Yeah, yeah, I love it. So, um, but but yeah, look, I I think I think Calvin Lockhart says these unbelievably silly lines, and yet he's saying them so straight, and he's making it so believable. He is treating the beast must die like it is King Lear. Right, and, and, you, you and can I, tell and he's a I stage actor too that. because of his delivery, yes. where yeah, he's absolutely. doing, he's projecting just like a little bit too much to be on film, where he's like, yeah. "And you are the werewolf, yeah, like yeah, my yeah, guy." Yeah. You, that's not and how you, you act on film. <laughs> Tonight is my last chance, the last night of the full moon, and I warn you both. Tonight. The beast must die. Yeah, yeah, I, no, but it, it's it's it, Paul Paul and that uh, said that you know it, again. It's, I think it's really uncharitable. It's kind of mean spirited. He said in an interview um, called "Directing the Beast," which was on the. 
uh, first ever DVD edition they put out of this. Um, and it is just literally him for 12 minutes in a room. But he said, like, quite uncharitably, oh, Calvin, he tried his best. And I, I, I think that's really disparaging about this performance. I think Calvin Lockhart, like you say, is fucking fantastic in this film. Like, not no joke, no punchline, not being ironic. Uh, I think in terms of performances within, like, 70s horror, this is, like, actually really, really good. And um, I, I, I agree. The stage delivery... Uh, uh, is a bit stilted, but I actually think it helps with the character. I think because he's like meant to be this big, high-powered boardroom, self-made, wealthy guy. It, it didn't bother who, me that much, but I could tell yeah, like this like, is a stage actor from his, watching. Him. Yeah, <laughs> his opening monologue is fucking fire, where he's going, "Yes, all my friends still in the same shanty town, yeah, hustling <laughs> tourists." And, yeah, all right, but, but I hustled the right it. tourists. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> it is it's great. fucking great. It is great so um half the kids i grew up with are right there in the same stinking shanty town still hustling spook tourists for a living look uh, the audience uh, you guys can live with having seen the beast must die i'm sure with the viewers of the podcast the regular fans they're probably going to hate this movie the worst out of all the movies we've ever <laughs> put forward and reviewed i don't care this this movie was formative to me. It was a collision of all the worlds I loved as a teenager. You know, a black exploitation themed werewolf movie, horror, black exploitation. These, these uh, getting to see Calvin Lockhart. And this was like one of the, my favorite. <laughs> this is, sounds ridiculous. This is one of my favorite movies. I didn't appreciate it enough actually when I was younger. I was in a band, and uh, I've lost touch with all of them. So, Rich, Alan, Isaac, if you uh, end up watching this somehow, I, I do miss you. We used to just get high and have a few and, and drink, and we would put on all these ridiculous films, and we were all aligned and kind of into the same thing. And so, we would watch black exploitation movies, we would watch these horror movies, and we must have rewatched this movie like dozens of times. So it was like growing up, this was like, like this was like comfort food. Uh, like we had running jokes about the werewolf break. We would just put our head around the corner, the werewolf break, and then go. Like, <laughs> so I, 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 I it's I, certainly going to become a story. joke on this show. I will reference it. No, like, it's too it good. Is, it's it is, too good. It is. <laughs> And, and and so for that alone, um, I hope the audience, is, uh, the viewers, are kind of a, a charitable about it. And as I said, I love the history of horror. And I think this is a really interesting relic, uh, you know, from that time. Sadly, when researching for this podcast, I couldn't find a Roger Ebert review. Um, <laughs> it slipped through the cracks. Roger I don't didn't. think he probably saw this. <laughs> which, which, which is interesting because uh, they did review that remake of uh the most dangerous game surviving the oh, game wow. they did review that uh, why <laughs> with do you know Ice that because <laughs> um, i that that was that was nearly a choice that was nearly a choice <laughs> I see. we could have watched that instead of this uh that was I, nearly what, I, what i'm understanding richard is just you're a weird fan of the most dangerous game <laughs> well listen I, I i do think uh that is a very important that's a seminal film actually in, in in terms of what it does but you see like you right i have my weird little uh you know peccadillos when it comes to uh films and so i even though i agree to normal minded people this film will be boring and slow uh having watched lots of these types of horror movies where it's like you have lulls and then big spikes and then it lulls again whereas a modern movie sensibility is you kind of it's like going up the roller coaster you ramp it up till you have the crescendo and then typically it, it just drops off in the in the final act and that and that's the film horror movies uh, from this time period and, and 50s 60s and, and 70s they're not like that they they they, they literally do have like I'm waiting for the next reveal. I'm waiting for the next bit. And so this movie is quite typical of the genre in that. I, mean, I don't think it's uniquely boring or bad or, or slow paced. Um, so yeah, uh, all, all of that is to say, I'm glad you watched it and, and I enjoy listening to the roast. This was just a vector for me to talk about something that I adore and I'm well, really, really we, passionate we should, about. We should actually just do black black exploitation movies at some point in time because it is. A, Listen, I think if we if we do if we do if we do, let me just put this out there. It's unrelated to the to what we're talking about now, but it's just to whet the appetite. We all can talk about Shaft till the cows come home. I'm sure we've seen Shaft. We all know Shaft. What people don't know is the sequel, Shaft in Africa. 
right? And Shaft in Africa, right? Duncan, you'll get this. Shaft goes to an African village. Oh, yeah, in anything, Scotland. shouldn't that be a prequel where he's like an ancient shark? Shaft, you know, that would be cooler. No, it's a sequel. He, he, he goes undercover to an African okay. village and he has, yeah. right, and he meets a woman who is about to have a clitorindectomy. She's about to have a clitoris oh, removed. No. And she's like, I've never it's known. Would be made this time, I'm right. telling you right now. Right. About to be and, in the and hero. She, okay. she's, and she's going, like, it's tradition here. It's what I'm yeah, going to do. Course. Shaft pipes her. That's a nice way of putting it. Shaft, Shaft sleeps with her. And afterwards, she goes, I have now decided I will not get my oh, clitorindectomy. No. That is a real scene. That is a real scene. Dear that Lord. really happens in Shaft in Africa. <laughs> also, he has to pretend he can't speak English. And he plays when he's undercover and he, he plays a guy called he, his character is Jowie is the name. And he's just going around like this, like to do this. To do this is outrageous. But he's just going around in Jowie like this. Um, it's also uh, worth uh, mentioning um uh what, what was he called uh uh bundini uh bundini brown the guy who wrote all the rhymes for like he was in the muhammad ali entourage uh he gets uh he gets an extended part in the sequel in shaft in africa so it's just him like rhyming and saying ridiculous things so it's uh, it's terrible it's terrible in all the right ways you want from a black exploitation film so if we do do black exploitation guys i'm bringing <laughs> I'm, I'm probably I'm gonna bring it. shaft in africa and the the thing with two heads which is also hilarious it's about a white racist gets a black guy's head surgically grafted onto him uh, oh no rather than no, the other way around the white racist gets surgically his head to survive he gets surgically grafted onto a black guy and has to go to harlem uh, it, 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 Brilliant. I have that on Blu ray too, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah, just to put a pin in it, uh, thanks for coming along for the ride of The Beast Must Die. I hope it has enhanced your life in the same way it enhanced mine. You will now forever know about the werewolf break, and you will forever get to, kn uh, to know about stupid, sexy Calvin Lockhart, who is like, un like, just what an absolute fitty he is in this film. <laughs> so there you go. So it was worth it for that. Very good. I think the concept is good. I like some of the actors in here, but the execution is just like, I mean, it's just, it's just boring. I wish it had been cheesier, honestly. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, uh, let's, let's move on. We've done all of I our... I'll just say, my final note would just be yeah. this. Like I said, I actually think if you shortened it, it would be fine. It couldn't even have been good. I also, you could have done actually more creative things with the premise and what was going on. This is like room to do that. My biggest problem overall is, uh, fuck, where was I going with that? Oh, like I said, it's, I, I don't think I could ever watch it again. I don't know what the point would be. It only worked no, the one time yeah. when I had no idea who the werewolf was. So I think it, it's actually, even though this is, which is the sign it's not a good film, because unfortunately I actually think, but it's weird. I love The Prestige. I could watch that one million times. And yes. every time yeah. the trick works on me, you know, <laughs> that, that wouldn't apply to this, obviously. <laughs> not, not a lot yeah, of clues, I, not a lot of nuance. No, uh, but, you know, they did say this was like the prestige of its time. So... <laughs> It's the way your joke is. You're trying to make it like this is actually the Rosetta Stone touchstone film that created know, every other great film it? in history. It's, all right. it's a good gag. It's a good running gag. It's all right. All right. Uh, just, by the way, just for the idiot Americans, when he said Ryan Johnson was influenced, he was obviously being sarcastic. He obviously yes. was not and probably never had seen this film. I don't I just know. Put there because I just I know what some people are like. Oh my god, really? I didn't know he did watch. He, he never saw it. No one ever saw this film. <laughs> if, if, a, if anyone did Ryan Johnson. Tears. If any, if anything, this is probably our one chance to ever actually get a sponsor directly to do with film. Yeah. Because if some streaming service notices we just got like five hundred people to watch this film, they're gonna. <laughs> that's a one way in because there's no other person could ever get five hundred people to watch this film. No I, I promise you that somebody's like, why the fuck in in August of 2024 are this many people watching? The Beast Must Die. Somebody is asking yes. that question, I promise you. This is like... And then hopefully it... they Google it, and then they find this video. And if so, yep. we are open to sponsorship. You can even suggest a shit film for each arc. Just give us that skrill. <laughs> yep. So, yeah. Uh, uh, on to 500 Days of Summer, which, as I said... I We're know for a fact for that one. The We're all gonna suffer. Yeah, I know that, that's the thing. I know I knew. I was like, yeah, go on, I'll give him the beast must die. I'll give him the beast must die. Because you can't fuck you can't fuck okay. that up compared Look, to five hundred days. I, I will There's say nothing I, think, I could have recommended. I think there are redeeming qualities to each of the movies that we picked. He's turning, he's turning, he's a werewolf. It's time <laughs> it's time for the shit film break. Yeah. You suck on this silver bullet, Monty. I need to test if you're being real right now, mate. What the, the fuck are you on about? Key, a good job we've all done 
own a million podcasts. I can tell you, I'm pretty good at like remembering people's names and knowing what to say. And spoiler, this fucking film is called The Minefield, if you understand the cast of the film, but I will just be yeah. referring to the name of the it, people <laughs> doing the characters or the character in the film. So I will never get into trouble. You'll never catch me. No one has ever caught me using those particular parts of the English language. You'll never get me. Keep trying. Nice trying. <laughs> um, so uh, I think there was maybe in all of the films we selected a kernel of a good idea that could have been executed better. There is no kernel of a good idea in 500 Days of Summer. It is just terrible. Uh, the concept is terrible. The execution is terrible. The message it tries to give is terrible. Uh, and Roger Ebert loved it. So, of course, we'll be doing that one next. So we will see you guys next week as all of us dread rewatching 500 Days of Summer. Please do not watch that movie. See you next time. Thank you.